You're listening to Creative Breakthrough, the podcast that provides you with the strategies to elevate your creative passion to the next level. I'm your host, creative hustler, and chicken wing lover, Shireen Kassam, aka The Funny Brown Girl. And yes, I have an unhealthy obsession with chicken wings. Now, get ready to flex your creative muscle and keep winning. Welcome to another episode of The Creative Breakthrough. I am your host, Shireen Kassam, aka The Funny Brown Girl. Hey, this week we're going to continue our conversation from about a month ago about side hustles. This is the second part of the series on side hustles, and today I have a really cool guest joining us. Henry Gibson is one of my friends. We met doing acting, and now he is a financial advisor, financial coach, and investment advisor. And he's going to share with us everything from starting a side hustle to if you have a full-time job, how you should be saving money, and how you can transition from being in a full-time job to being a full-time creative and what you should think about. So super interesting conversation coming up. I want to caveat this. I am not being sponsored for this um, episode. And I am not advocating that you use Henry's services or his company for your accounting or financial needs. He's just a friend who I reached out to to see if he would talk to us about saving money and how to transition, especially during a time of COVID and what we should be thinking about if we're starting a side hustle in terms of expenses and taxes and all that good stuff. So just want to caveat that um, really interesting conversation. Before I get started though, a couple, couple of announcements. One, because I have so much free time and all the things that I do, and if you didn't notice, that was sarcasm, I have started a second podcast with my podcast producer, Phil Bird. Phil Bird used to be on ESPN, and he's now the podcast doctor, helping other people and small businesses start their own podcast. And so we've decided to create our own pos- podcast called Radio Rejects, because we both were on the radio and now we're not. And we're going to do it every other week on Sunday, and it's going to go live on Facebook, and then we'll post the uh, the live the replay on Facebook as well as YouTube, so you can always check it out. But it's going to be a lot of fun, so definitely follow me on Facebook at Funny Brown Girl. You can just go to Facebook.com Funny Brown Girl to get all the notifications of us going live, or on YouTube. Um, that's YouTube.com forward slash C forward slash Funny Brown Girl. Or just join my email list at funnybrowngirl.com and I will send out an email every time we're going live. So definitely get on that bandwagon because it's going to be a hoot and a holler and we're not going to talk about creativity on that podcast. That podcast is more like about us and what we're doing and cool things that we're trying. Um, We're always going to be checking out chicken wings. So last week we checked out the four new flavors from Buffalo Wild Wings. So if you're curious about what we thought about the four new flavors, which are pizza, orange chicken, Grim Reaper, and Lemon Pepper, check out last week's episode. Another announcement is we did talk about side hustles in the last episode, and I said to you all, please reach out to me if you have questions, and so many of you did, and thank you for reaching out. It was a blast talking to you all and working through your side hustles with you. One of the questions I got a lot is, how much money should I invest in my side hustle? How much money should I get started with? And Henry's actually going to talk about that um, a little bit in this conversation that we have, but I wanted to share with you how much I spent when I started a side hustle. So my first side hustle that I started was stand-up comedy. Obviously, when I started stand-up comedy, it was not a side hustle. It was a passion. I wasn't getting paid to do stand-up comedy. Um, I mean, I was getting paid like $20 a week here and there for like showcases and stuff, but it only has now become a side hustle where I'm doing corporate gigs and speaking engagements and all that fun stuff. But when I started doing stand-up comedy, my initial expenses were I paid about $250 to take a stand-up comedy class. I paid about $10 for a comedy book on how to do comedy. Um, Obviously, I bought a notebook and a pen, and then I bought about $50 worth of DVDs because I really just wanted to consume as much stand-up comedy as I could, so I bought some DVDs. So really small um, uh, introductory cost there, about $300, maybe $350 at the most for that. Um, when I started this podcast, again, my costs were pretty low to do a podcast. You just, you need a laptop, which I already had. Luckily you need a microphone. My friend gave me a microphone. So I had that for free. My most expensive thing is I bought what's called a mobile, um, device so that I could record on the go if I wanted to do that. Because when I first started this podcast, I actually thought I was going to do a travel podcast and do live podcasting while I was traveling. 
Um, so I spent $350 on this gizmo, which I still use when I'm recording. Um, so it's not a total waste, but I didn't really need it. I could have gotten away without buying that thing um, because I don't do a mobile podcast. And then I pay $15 a month to host my podcast on a hosting site. So all in all, I paid uh, my intro fees to get started in podcasting was about $350. And then I pay $15 a month. You obviously can get this done a lot cheaper. I know people who do podcasting through their phones using a headset. Um, you can now host your podcast for free on different websites, including anchor.com. So definitely check that out if you're interested in a podcast. You can start a podcast for free. When I started my CBD business, which is my e-commerce business, um, my expenses basically were, when I first decided I really wanted to jump into the e-commerce business, I knew I had to find the vendors. And I knew which vendors I wanted to use because I'd already tried all the products, but I needed to get in front of them to get their price list and get, get, get to know them on a one-on-one -on -one basis because I don't really like doing that whole emailing people and then they don't know who you are because I don't feel like you get the same um, attention. Like you don't get the same like, oh, I know who you are. I'm going to give you the best discount or the best prices. So I paid about $100 to go to an expo, and that's where I met everybody that I wanted to purchase from. So that was one of my costs. My initial inventory um, buy was only $500. I made sure that I only bought $500 worth of inventory because I didn't want to start too big and then be stuck with a lot of inventory. Um, so I was very careful with who I purchased my inventory from. A lot of them had um, re refunds where you could return the inventory if you didn't sell it. So that's really important. So if you are starting a business where you're going to purchase inventory, check with them. Find out what is their minimum order quantity. Make sure you understand what their shipping is. Some people will really aren't nickel and dime you on shipping because that's where they try to make a lot of money from. So check that and then see if they have a return um, a return. And then, and then see if they have a return policy. Sometimes they'll in 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, they'll take the merchandise back from you if it's not selling. So definitely look into that as well. So I bought $500 worth of inventory and then I spent $1,000 on letting someone make my website. I probably could have done it myself because now I fix and change everything on my website myself. But in the beginning, it felt like a daunting task and it was very timely. And I didn't want to spend my time building the website when someone else could have. And I'm glad that I let him do it because there was a lot of coding that he fixed and changed so that it looked just the way I wanted. So that was $1,000 on that. And then I host my site on Shopify.com. And I've talked about Shopify a lot. If you're going to do an e-commerce business and you can do the marketing yourself, I would highly recommend Shopify.com. If you don't want to do the marketing, I would go to Etsy.com. If you are interested in Shopify, I can give you a 14-day free trial. Just go to funnybrowngirl.com forward slash Shopify. But I pay Shopify $30 a month. Um, to host my site, plus I pay them a transaction fee. So every time somebody's using a credit card, they get a percentage of that. So all in all, my cost to start my CBD business was about $1,600. And then lastly, I, as I mentioned before, I started another e-commerce business called Woman Della, and I sell products uh, made from women in Africa, from East Africa and South Africa specifically, and most of it's like pouches and jewelry. And my upfront cost for that was about $500. And then I pay Etsy 60 cents a month for each product, each pro and then I pay 60 cents a month to Etsy for each product that I have listed on their website. So all in all, again, a really small startup cost of $500. So really make, sh make sure you budget how much you're willing to lose because that's how I did it. I was like, okay, if I put $500 into this business and $500 into this business and then I don't do anything or I don't sell anything or I get no traffic coming to my site, am I okay losing that $500? So it's what you're comfortable losing and what you're comfortable that you have that money to even play with. I know right now is a really tough time to just have $500 sitting around because of COVID and furloughs and layoffs and just the way the economy is. So just be very careful. Um, one of the things I really learned from the CBD business is that I was purchasing a lot of products from different companies and I was getting really um, taken advantage of in terms of shipping. Shipping was kicking my butt. Like it was one of my highest expenses. So I was able to find a vendor here in Florida where I get all my stuff from. So I, was, I started consolidating my products so that I only buy it from one company or two companies. That way you get a better price. You don't pay as much in shipping. And because they're so close to where I live, I, they are actually, I can drive to them and it takes me about 30 minutes. I can purchase on demand. So I don't have to buy a hundred units at one go. I can
can purchase 10 units at one go and the next week go buy another 10 and then another 10 and really just keep incre incrementally increasing how much I want to buy. So these are things to think about if you're going to go into a physical product um, side hustle. So that was like one of the questions I got. Really great question. I hope I answered it. Again, continue to reach out to me. I know I said I would only Skype with a few of you, but um, I have some time right now with the holidays coming up. So if you have questions, hit me up. Hi at funnybrowngirl.com. On Instagram, I'm Funny Brown Girl. Facebook, Funny Brown Girl. Twitter, Funny Brown Girl. TikTok, Funny Brown Girl. Um, so send me a message. If you have any questions, concerns, let's, let's work together. Okay, so like I said, today we have a really great guest. Henry Gibson and I met during doing acting. Henry Gibson Garcia began his career as an actor, performing on stage in and in front of the camera for over a decade. Starting in 2019, he began using the skills he developed as an actor and director to provide training in leadership collaboration and communication to medical school students through improv, aka side hustle. Earlier this year, after years of reading and studying personal finance, he became a financial coach and investment advisor with Plan and Act, a wealth management firm seeking to provide finance advice to ordinary Americans. With a background in coaching and with real experience of what it's like to survive as a creative, Henry hopes he can make a positive difference in people's lives. So what are we waiting for? Let's get started. Welcome to the guest chair, Henry. It's so great to see you or hear you for those of you on YouTube or listening. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, yeah, no, it's uh, it's great to be here. Um, I'm I'm excited to be here because uh, this is this is something I'm really passionate about. Um, I've been a an actor. I was an actor for you know over a decade. I made a living as an actor, and then and the whole time, like in college, uh, I took these courses on on finance because I thought at some point I'm gonna have money. How do I uh, how do what do I do with it once I actually have that money? And um, and I finally kind of did. And I realized that, that those courses and those things that I've been learning along the way, they were so important that I've actually made the switch over to finance now. So I'm with a company called Plan and Act. Uh, and they're, they're just really good. They're so focused on helping normal people like creatives with side hustles. Oh, that's awesome. Well, that's exactly then what I want to talk to you about because I need your help. <laughs> so tell us, okay, let's start let's start smaller picture, I guess, in terms of COVID. Let's, let's walk, let's go from COVID and then back into reality. Okay. For those of us struggling with COVID right now, like what is, what is the piece of advice you would give us? Like creatives who might be out of work right now, um, like Disney just let off 7,000 entertainers, performers, comedy clubs haven't opened everywhere in the country yet. Acting now, like film isn't really shooting. Um, you're doing auditions from home. Like what, what is some like nuggets that we should be thinking about or paying attention to right now while we are kind of struggling to figure out our next steps? Yeah. Uh, well, I guess, I mean, the most important thing is you can't lose hope. You know, there's, yeah. it, there's, there's always something to do. There's, I've, I've been amazed and inspired by my friends. Cause like, I've, like, I've seen them get laid off. I've seen them get furloughed. And I know one guy started a woodworking business. Oh, nice! Who like I I would never have, I would never have pictured him for to be a woodworker, but he's like churning out these like he's got some contracts already that I saw on Facebook. Um, so he like turned to woodworking. I've seen other people turn to baking, and they they've got these pictures of these delicious desserts. Yes. And so there's always there's I get I think that's like the number one thing. It's just like you can't lose hope because um, I mean we're we're I, when you're creative, that's kind of our number one job anyway is uh you know there we're always fighting for that next job and so that's that's got to always be our number one thing is we just got to be able to keep trucking yeah, um exactly yeah so i think that's that's the number one thing because if you can't if you the thing is that if you if you lose that mindset then no matter what strategy i present that it's, it's just going to go out the window when with the first gust of wind so uh so keep hope and keep believing in yourself so that's like that's that's number one for me um that's huge that's huge for me um, also, um, I, there's, uh, as people are shifting over into these side hustles, uh, one thing to think about is, um, there's, there's a few things to think about financially. Uh, one of them is, and I think you talked about this in your last, in your, in your, uh, first one, the podcast that I listened to is know your worth. Um, cause 100. yeah, cause you're, you're now, you know, we're actors. We're, we're always, we're always a business anyway. We're a solo proprietorship. And so if we start taking these jobs that pay pennies per hour, 
it, it's not sustainable and we burn out. And that goes even more so for side hustles. Just know your worth, make sure you're covering the cost of the goods that you're, that you're, get, that you're using, and also make sure that you're paying yourself an hourly wage. Um, Cause otherwise you're, you're just not gonna be able to, to survive. You're gonna slowly start chipping away at your savings and instead of, it's gonna be the death of a thousand cuts, which yes. is gonna be kind of rough to, to go through. So know your worth, don't be afraid to charge what you're worth. There's still people going out and buying Starbucks every day, you know, and Starbucks needs that money less than you. So uh, know your worth. People are still spending that money. Don't don't go think with that mindset of like nobody's nobody wants to buy anything. People still want to buy stuff. So don't be afraid to charge what you're worth. Um, beyond that. Uh, Remember to save your receipts. It sounds like uh, it sounds really uh, I don't know tech like boring. <laughs> it's not a, it's not a sexy piece of advice to to save a piece of paper, uh, but especially if you're doing stuff as a contractor, if you're uh, making income doing like Uber, uh, you're getting income from Uber now or one of those one of those side gigs as well. You're getting a 1099 at the end of the year and. Basically, any anything you spend, any of your expenses in service of getting that income, gets uh, gets written off at the oh, wow. at, around tax time. So like yeah. gas mileage. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. So if you're um, but it's got to be against that 1099 return. Mm -hmm. So if you're, uh, this is like one of the things with the new tax plan that we can't. Uh, if you have a W two, you can't write off expenses against the against that income. Okay. Um, which kind of, which was, has been frustrating for creatives in over the past year, because we can't, you, we were no longer able, able to write off audition tapes, for instance, mm -hmm. uh, against, uh, against that income, because we were getting W-2s from like Universal or Disney or whatever. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So in some ways, getting, being able to free yourself up to be a, a true contractor, if you, if you do it right, it's going to be hard, but if you do it right at the end of the year, you're actually going to be, be saving a lot on, on taxes. Um, which is, you know, at least there's one bright side. <laughs> <laughs> and now, because creative, sometimes we tend to be a little disorganized. So instead of saving receipts, can we just get a dedicated credit card and just put everything on that credit card and those are our expenses or we'll have to show the actual receipt at the end of the day? It really helps if you can show the actual receipt. So okay. if you can, if you do the dedicated credit card, that is actually, that is a, actually a really good strategy. There's also a lot of apps out there that are, that are free that you can like, just take a picture of the receipt and then it's automatically saved for you. So you don't have to keep the, the actual paper pieces. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, I'm trying I will to find those and add them to the show notes, guys. Yeah, I think QuickBooks has has a free one. Um, okay. uh, that, that was the main one because I used to I, I used to drive shipped as well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that was the grocery shopping one. Right. So uh, I, that was how I tracked mileage. There's but there's like a whole bunch of free apps out there yeah, that can do okay. that for you. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, also, and uh, you know, if uh, I know a lot of people, and I've seen a lot of people uh, turning to Patreon as they're, yes. you know, making drawings and things like that. Um, Patreon that should be a 1099 expense as well, or 10, 1099 income. So you should, you'll be able to write off the costs of of providing those services. So, if, like my friends who through Patreon, they're they're doing art, they're mm -hmm. painting things. You can write off those painting supplies that you wow, use to make that okay. income things like that, but you have, and this is where the saving receipts com comes into play. You have to be able to show that those, re that those expenses came from the, yeah, that those expenses came from something that you use to make that 1099 right. income. Got it. Okay. So yeah. now let's say, for example, like these people on Patreon are drawing this art and maybe, bef and now they're sitting at home drawing this art. So now when they do their taxes, will their home be considered a business expense? Is that considered a home office now too? Yeah, it's something like the uh, you end up calculating the like square footage mm -hmm. of uh, of the like I'm in my home office right now. So I calculate the square footage of my home office, find out what percentage it was from uh, from the whole the whole house. Mm -hmm. So let's say this isn't the case. But let's say <laughs> this this room, this is a much smaller room. But uh, let's say this room was like 25 percent, a quarter of the square footage of the entire house uh, at the end of the year. You would use that 25 percent, pull 20 and 25 percent of your total housing expenses. You'd be able to write those off because okay. uh, against the 1099 income. Got it. But so, like, say, like, I do comedy. I'm a stand-up comedian. I used to go to clubs and do shows, right? And I would get a 1099, and my expenses against that were usually like 
Um, I don't know. If, you can't claim gas and mileage, right? I think it was one or the other. Is that correct? Yeah. Basically, basically what you end up doing is use the, the standard deduction. I think it's mm -hmm. like 54 cents per mile okay. uh, last year, yeah. I think it was. Because um, okay. that takes gas and wear and tear of the car as well. Right. Which was always less than what my gas was. Um, <laughs> because my, gas, my car is not gas efficient, fuel efficient. So and then I would claim food. But now, because I'm performing comedy from my house and doing Zoom shows, could I claim my office? as a comedy expense because I'm doing Zoom shows out of my, this portion of my house? Yeah, I think so. And, and um, you know, you'd have to, uh, you know, talk your, if you have an accountant, talk, talk to them to double check. Uh, mm -hmm. But I, I think that should be, I think that should be good. I know just talking about that, if you bought that microphone to, mm -hmm. to and use it, are using it to make income, yes. that's a, you can write oh, really? that off. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Like literally everything. And this is, uh, and this is so where this laptop I, too, that I'm talking to you through the laptop as well, because uh, I, the zoom show is through the laptop. Uh, if you, if you bought it, if you bought it this year, then I think mm -hmm. the, you'd be able to, right. to say okay. that. Yeah. Um, but like your zoom subscription, because mm -hmm. you need it to be able to make the income that that's a tax write off. Um, okay. it's everything that you're, any money you spent. And that's mm -hmm. why receipts come into play. Any money you spent that you can prove or in service to that 1099 income. Mm -hmm. Okay, very cool. Okay, so you said things I need to know, I need to believe in myself or have mm -hmm. hope. I need to know my self-worth mm -hmm. and I need, what was the third one? Uh, save your receipts. Save my receipts, yes, that was yeah. the big one. <laughs> yeah, okay. that's the, that, that's a tough one for a lot of people. I, uh, <laughs> you know, it's, and it's, it's tough for me too. We, uh, what we ended up having to do because we have housing expenses now, we, uh, we have like an envelope that we have mag uh, like put on a magnet on the fridge. Mm -hmm. Anytime we spend any money for the house, we immediately put it in there because it's, it's a really hard thing to like, you know, I, I would always keep the receipts in my wallet. They would fade and it'd be, <laughs> they would be useless after that. So I know. Well, that's why I lost my train of thought. Cause you were like saying these things and then in my head, I'm like, Oh my God, these receipts are everywhere. I need to like start like Mm -hmm. relating them and putting them somewhere yeah uh, try taking try doing the taking the picture thing because that mm -hmm. that way you don't have to worry about the paper you can put them in a folder on on the cloud on your computer and that way you, you just have them forever and you can you can always reference them okay very cool anything else that we should be paying attention to or being aware of uh one thing that i've actually seen a lot of, like some a few people do uh, which is not a, this is this is kind of like a habit to stay away from uh, okay. is uh, <laughs> making sure that when you're when you're starting these side hustles, uh, don't don't fund your enterprise entirely with your credit card, because um, unless you can pay it off, unless you can pay off a credit card at, at the end of the month, um, your that interest rate on a credit card it's just so high that you're going to very quickly start falling behind. So and this is this is good advice, not even just for side hustles or for COVID. But like whenever you start, whenever you're starting your own business, it's a good idea to try not to fund it with your credit card because you're just, it's just not going to be sustainable in, in the long run. Yeah, for sure. Actually going to credit cards, because I've heard this a lot from creatives. Creatives are always telling me, Shreen, because I'll ask them like why they charge like everything on their credit cards, even when I know they don't have that money to pay off their credit card. <laughs> and they say that they're always, they charge things to their credit card and then they pay the late fees or, and they pay the, they, they roll over their their debt month to month and pay the interest on it because they're trying to build up their credit. True or false? Is that how you build up credit? That is, that's false. Okay. Um, yeah, you can build up credit just by, you're, you're making on-time payments. So if you pay it off in full at the mm -hmm. end of the month, uh, then you're, you're already building up your credit doing that. If you start getting those, getting that interest, you're just giving more money to that, to that credit card company without any more, any benefit to you. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's, that's what I try to tell them, but now I'm going to, I'm going to clip this and send it to them. <laughs> okay. Yeah. It's, it's, it's hard, especially with credit cards. Cause it's so easy to just like, there's like something mental about it. it's easy to swipe and it's just a number. So it's abstract. Um, so I'm, cause that, that was my big thing. That, the big problem that I fell into years ago was credit card debt. Uh, so it, I, let me tell you from experience, it's hard. It's very difficult to pull out of it. There's different ways to do it though. Even if you think it's unmanageable, there's always there's always a way. Um, there you can you know credit counseling. You can negotiate and reach a settlement with with the credit card companies. Uh, but yeah, credit cards pay them off at the end of the month. Otherwise, you're going to end up under a mountain. Mm -hmm. What is better? Like, say I have I have credit card debt to pay off, and I have a car loan, and I have a mortgage. What should I try to pay off first? 
uh, you should, uh, you know, generally speaking, uh, you, you know, make make the bare minimum payments <laughs> on all of them. You because you're gonna need that car, so you don't mm -hmm. want that repo. You, you're gonna need the the house, um, but. Te gen generally just focus on the credit cards. Any extra mm -hmm. money you're sending at paying off debt, focus on the credit cards. Mortgage is actually uh, tax, the interest on a mortgage is tax deductible uh, okay. at the end of the year. So um, that at the, we're, I'm actually a big fan of having a mortgage because you can, there's different ways to use that, that debt to increase your, so long as you're doing it the right way. There's, <laughs> and that's where like my company can, can help, but uh, you know, don't, don't buy a house with like a hundred percent financing, but um, there's ways to mortgage debt is not as evil as we've been told basically. Mm -hmm. um, and okay. even car debt. I mean, a car loan that helps you get, get a new job that might, that might pay better um, which is what a couple people have are, are already told me. And so a car loan is not a necessarily a bad debt. It's only if you're paying off car loan like six years from now and you don't even have the car anymore <laughs> at that point then it's then it's it becomes bad um mm -hmm. but credit card debt pay that off every single month that that's what your money should go towards okay okay so now for the creatives like sitting at home right now who who are who maybe don't who are just starting a side hustle or maybe are still trying to think of their side hustle idea um what are some things they need to be other than like take charging what they're worth and keeping track of receipts anything else that they should be aware of financially uh financially um, it's even if you don't need the income financially, a side hustle is actually, uh, can actually be really good, good for you. Mm -hmm. Um, because you're going to be adding skills that you can put on your resume, yep. uh, and using the, and you're going to be able to network using that side hustle in ways that you're not going to be able to do just in your normal W2, W4 job. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's, uh, it's in a lot of ways, depending on what the side hustle is, if you're starting, like my, my buddy who's a woodworker now, I mean, he's working entirely on his own time. So he's making his own use of his own time in, as opposed to working for somebody else's to increase another CEO's right. uh, net worth. So there's a, lot of, there's a lot of really good benefits to having a side hustle, even if, even if you don't need it. Um, it can be really fulfilling, um, for especially what I've, I've seen from, from COVID. Some people have just <laughs> really gone into to baking and mm -hmm. and they look and they look so happy i've talked to them and they're so fulfilled that they get to do this and you know nurture people in a way that they weren't doing before um so you know just so financially there's and financially and emotionally there's just so many benefits to actually mm -hmm. doing having a side hustle when you talk to your friends who are like baking and woodworking how do you make sure how do they make sure or even talking to you like how do they make sure that they're actually making money Cause like, like you said earlier, like sometimes people start a side hustle and they think it's a passion project. Um, and so they're not actually making money out of it. And so what's your advice to those people? Like in terms of make money. <laughs> Got you. I think that goes down, that goes back to the save the receipts thing. Um, mm -hmm. Cause uh, you, at the end of the month, you'll be able to look back and you'll be able to go, okay, this is how much money I had to spend in order to, in order to make this much money. And mm -hmm. that second number, should always be much should always be bigger mm -hmm. <laughs> hopefully much bigger than, than that first number uh so that way you're you're keeping ahead um because uh otherwise like i said it's just going to be a death of a thousand cuts um yep. so keep use those those receipts that, that we mentioned saving those are going to be great for taxes at the end of the year and also to be able to just constantly reevaluate how your business is doing mm -hmm. And now, like, say you said, um, I want to start a side hustle and you said not to start it on my credit card. Where, what, how else can I get the funding? If I want, say I need $5,000 to start my business. Like, where can I go for that $5,000? There's a, there's a couple different avenues to take, especially for minorities. There's actually like grants and stuff. I, I haven't, I haven't started a company, so I have, I, I haven't actually gone through this process, but I know that there's grants out there for minorities, for women, uh, to, to start companies. Um, sometimes you can even go to a bank uh, and start a business line of credit okay. and they can actually have access to those, to those same grants. So they can use that to kind of help secure, uh, to help secure a loan to get you started as well. Oh, okay. Very cool. Okay. Yeah. And so when they go to the bank, they just ask for a business line of credit. Yeah. Yeah. And then, and that, that's, I think with something like Jay-Z said that uh, I'm not, I'm not a businessman. I'm a business man. Uh, so <laughs> Uh, and that's, that's kind of what we're aiming to do here for, for creatives as well. Um, make sure that you're aware that you are, you are the business. Mm -hmm. uh, so starting that business line of credit, 
And that's going to be, that's going to be huge. Do you have to shop around for that? Like do banks differ in terms of what they offer in terms of like rates and stuff? Is that something people need to like go be savvy about and talk to a few different banks? Yeah, I would. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Now say for the people who might have a job right now and maybe uncertainty, right? Like, are they going to keep the job? Is the company going to fold? What are some things that people who have a job, maybe in some income coming in right now should be preparing for and how should they prepare? Uh, so um, I think it's, you know, especially, you know, we, we've seen at the theme parks that unfortunately no jobs are are hundred percent secure. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think using the tools that are at your disposal uh, to kind of maximize your income. We work with a lot of people. And one of the big things that we talk about right away is make sure you're contributing to your 401k. Right. Um, 401ks uh, or or the, a retirement type of account that your employer might be might be providing, uh, and because with a four hundred one k, that's money that's tax deductible, that's tax deferred rather. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's uh, you don't get taxed on whatever money you put in there. On top of that, you're gonna uh, if you're under a certain amount of income, which I can't remember right now, you get something called the retirement savers tax credit. So okay. you're gonna get some of that money back when it comes to tax time. Okay. And uh, also, there's also the employer match. So if you, I, I forget exactly what the rate is, but it's like if you put in 3% of your annual income uh, or your weekly income into, into a 401k, the employer puts in 2%. So you, mm -hmm. you're basically getting free money from your employer just to be putting money into this, into this retirement savings account. Because um, what, what ends up happening is that you're going to be able to withdraw that money or give a loan to yourself uh, one, if you do lose your employment and that 401k is actually a really powerful financial tool. Uh, even if you, uh, even if you've managed, if you keep the job, um, you're going to be able to borrow against it to buy a house maybe someday, um, things like that. So that 401k is a really strong and powerful financial tool that you'll be able to, you'll be able to use. Now, should people max it out? I think it's what, 18.5 right now or 19,000, or should they max it to the amount that the employer will match? What's that kind of that kind of depends on where where the uh, where an individual uh, the person is with mm -hmm. with their income and with their financials. Um, so uh, we we have different algorithms that we use to to tell that. But the general rule of thumb that we that we say is that uh, you want to get to a point where you're putting you're saving ten percent to. I know I know some people who are putting fifty percent of their uh, income in into these accounts. Mm -hmm. um, because uh, that's one of the first steps is getting to that point where you can maximize those those 401k contributions, but that's not that's not everybody. You know, not, I I don't think I, I don't even have the 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 nineteen thousand to to put into know, a 401k. I don't either, but somebody was arguing. Somebody was like, you should just put all like every dollar you make goes should go into a 401k. And I was like, well, what about paying my rent? <laughs> yeah, no, but yeah, that's that that's a little bit extreme. That no, I wouldn't I wouldn't recommend that. It. Every, everybody's different. So um, mm -hmm. you kind of want to like, it, you want to balance the 401k savings because that's your emergency, your real emergency fund in case mm -hmm. you can't make income anymore uh, with your with liquidity, which means how much money is immediately available. Mm -hmm. um, so combined with those two amounts, we say like you should be able to pay rent or mortgage for like two years or something to get to that point. Uh, obviously, not, we're not everybody's there right away, um, but that's kind of the point we want to get everybody. Um, but yeah, you want to, there's definitely a balance between those two. You don't want to put everything here because then suddenly you, a car breaks and you're going to have to pull money from the 401k and that's, that's not a good way to go. When you said um, two years worth of income, two years worth of uh, rent and I forget what the second word you said, is that how much we should have in our savings to cover two years? It's not, it's, it's how much we, it's in our algorithms, it's what we work towards to get everybody to. So that way they can feel a little bit, they can feel a little bit more safe and comfortable. Um, Cause that way it, they have a solid foundation. Um, and we work and we work with different, like I said, different algorithms to say how much you should be putting aside to mm -hmm. get to that point. Uh, because obviously, I mean, rent in Orlando is uh, what a thousand dollars for a two bedroom or something like that, or one bedroom. Really? Where are the, you living? I've never seen a thousand dollars. It, it's yeah well it's super high so it's like you know th th it's not where we're all starting but it's kind of it's where we we try to get people to to get to so they they can feel safer okay so max out your 401k what else should i do before i get laid off 
uh, use the 401k, uh, start, uh, start thinking about uh, just what makes you passionate right now. This isn't a financial piece of advice, but again, those skills on the resume that are going to make you marketable to other people, mm-hmm. that, then you, if you start thinking in terms of that, of how, can I, how am I going to be able to market myself to other people, you can use, uh, you can say like, oh, hey, I have, you know, like a lot of people that I know, I have this skill in baking. Why don't I work on that? So then they can develop a skill and be ready by the time that the need really arises for them to have the side hustle going. So now I see a lot of people, I've been watching the news a lot, and a lot of people have been playing the stock market and getting Robinhood. What are your thoughts on Robinhood and playing the stock market to make some quick money? Bad idea. It's because <laughs> it's a terrible idea. It's, there's, <laughs> Oh man, there's not much, there's not, okay. So <laughs> there's, there's so much behind this. Uh, so basically if you're, if you're investing in the stock market and you're trying to pick an individual stock, if you're saying like, Hey, I want to become rich by buying Apple or Tesla, you're gambling, you're, you're, you're flat out gambling. You're going to the roulette table. That's, and that's money that you should be putting aside, getting ready in case something happens to your job. Cause Tesla Say Elon Musk has a heart attack tomorrow. Well, crazier things have happened. Tesla will tank, and there suddenly goes all of your all of your savings. You can't invest with any money that you can you cannot afford to lose. Mm-hmm. So better than picking stocks like that, which which Robinhood it basically encourages. Um, it's a better idea to get these broad, passively managed mutual funds uh, like the S and P uh, passively uh, index fund, S and P index fund. Um, and, and that's something that, but again, that's not for everybody because, uh, because it's just, you know, that even that is, even that's a risk and it all kind of depends on where you are in life. Mm-hmm. Uh, first, the first steps I would say are definitely building up that your savings, your liquidity and your 401k, your emergency fund. Cause once you get into investing, there's, there is a science behind it that we help with, but it, <laughs> it's just also particular to like, how much risk can you actually can you actually hold right now? Mm-hmm. Um, some people are getting into the stock market and they're like about to retire. And it's like, no, yeah. don't. <laughs> that's, you need to have that money ready to give you income in retirement. It's, mm-hmm. So there's some really bad things that can happen if you put money into the stock market without knowing what you're doing. And um, the general, the normal person trying to pick a stock, we're getting information after people working full time in the stock market, get the information. Mm -hmm. So we're always going to be late to the party and we're always going to be losing. Mm -hmm. So let's pretend, let's hypothetically say we are in the best economy in the world right now. COVID is gone, comedy clubs are back open, movies are starting to shoot again. What advice would you have for someone who has a full-time job that wants to leave it and go become a full-time creative? Like what are some things they should be preparing for financially to make that, to make that move? Yeah. Um, at that point, that, that kind of move, uh, you would need more liquidity. You would need more, more money in your checking and savings account that you can have immediately available. Um, because, uh, and, and again, and again, you know, I don't have the, I don't have the algorithms that I can just like, mm-hmm. no, that's <laughs> fine. Give, but like, uh, but yeah, we, you typically, you're going to, you're going to be able to, you're going to need to be able to withstand more risk while mm-hmm. you're getting that new career started up. So more money in a checking and savings account that's immediately available. Um, than if you had a steady employment. Mm-hmm. Is there any like rule of thumb how much money you should have saved up or how much liquidity you should have before making such a drastic move? Um, it's a certain, I can't remember. It's a certain percentage of uh, your your like annual income. That's, that's what we use. Mm-hmm. We use our main two metrics that we use are annual income and net worth. Mm-hmm. And uh, I can't remember the exact percentage, but it's it's definitely more. Uh, for you, you definitely need more in liquidity if you uh, if you're trying to have if you have a volatile career mm-hmm. like being an actor you just need to have more saved up for those lean months because um, you know March through June there's just not as much happening in Orlando right. uh, but then you make money the rest of the year and build that savings back up mm-hmm. okay so what as we wrap up like what other advice do you have for creatives like what should we be thinking about even if or even if we've already thought about it, like what should we be putting into action? Uh, I would, uh, you know, I will say one other thing too, is that it's okay to hire somebody. I mean, I know I'm plugging my, myself here, but not even just <laughs> us, um, like even a, a, a tax accountant at the end of the year, they're going to they're gonna be able to help people out in so many ways. Uh, you know, that's one of the things that like, 
the wealth, the people born into wealth, they know to go find people who know how to deal with money, like tax mm -hmm. accountants, because we just don't know. I had, I had no idea that the retirement tax savers credit was a thing until right. I hired an accountant. So hiring an accountant, hiring people who know how to deal with money, that actually ends up paying you back in, in the long run, uh, especially if you're starting a business and you're not sure how profitable your business is. They, an accountant can help you look at your numbers so they can go, oh, hey, look, your, your expenses this month were 3000 You only made 2000 mm -hmm. So you're going to need to re-examine something. Mm -hmm. um, so that that's something. Hi, creatives, I think we have a hard time asking for help like that or hiring help like that because we just, we just don't know. Yeah, we just don't know and we don't want to get scammed because I think a lot of us have been scammed in the industry. <laughs> we're yeah. just not trying to get scammed outside of the industry as well. Yeah. But I do like I agree with you. Like I don't have a I don't have an accountant full time, but I do have somebody who prepares my taxes for me. Mm -hmm. um, and I would say the amount of money I pay him to do my taxes, I make back double because he he always finds ways, like with the comedy stuff, like how to how to position it and ask the right questions so that it's it's actually we submit it as a business so that I do get a tax write off. Um, yeah, that's exactly it. I uh, you know I. If I had known that that could happen, I would have hired an accountant like years ago. I, we've only used an accountant for like two years now uh, since since my wife and I got married. And just the, the, you know, I can see the amount of money we saved each mm -hmm. of those years. And I'm like, if it hadn't been for her, we would, we, I would have either committed fraud or, <laughs> or we would have paid thousands more dollars. Yeah. And so, it, and that's just, that's just not worth it, you know? Um, mm -hmm. I, I don't mind paying taxes, but I also think that I also want people to keep as much as they can. Right. Um, well, it's like I, what Donald Trump said, like when he, when his tax return was only $750, I don't remember the exact line, but he said something like he paid his taxes. He's just savvy enough to know how to, how to manipulate the rules and go around, go around the rules and do the right, like play with the rules so that he only had to pay $750, you know, yeah. whether he legally did it or not, I'm not going to get into that, but the phrasing was that he knew the rules and we, we, I don't know the rules and it, most of us as creatives don't know the rules because we're not going to sit down and read a textbook. So that's exactly it. And you know, uh, that, and you know, Donald Trump, he, you know, he grew up in that wealthy atmosphere. Mm -hmm. So he knew I need to hire people to do this for me. And he's yeah. saved, he's probably saved so much money over the years. Uh, just just from taxes yeah no and it's true because i even when you start your side hustle guys you're gonna have to probably pay sales tax um mm -hmm. and I, I the first couple of months i had no idea how to do it i was overpaying and so then i then i got a little savvy about it i sat down and was like i need to figure this out because i should not be overpaying sales tax so the tax thing that is there to haunt you so it's definitely something to learn yeah absolutely what other pieces of advice would you leave us with uh, you know, uh, I, I guess it's, I, I just, I have, I have a lot of hope for everybody listening to this. Um, it, cause it, it's, you know, it, it, it's, it's scary, but it, one of the things that I believe is that if, if you encounter something that is scary, then you're probably going in the right direction. Um, and, and so I, there's so much opportunity ahead of, ahead of you. If you're, if you're listening to this and you're just starting your side hustle or you're, you're thinking about it. So I, I just, I hope all the best for you and I hope you become a millionaire. Um, <laughs> one of the, one of the things Amen. is, yeah, one of, I mean, you know, speaking of Donald Trump, one, one of the things is that like uh, most rich people are white. So uh, I hope that, you know, people listening to this, you know, get inspired and go do something, discover something, innovate some industry or other, you know, break new comedic ground and uh, become another minority millionaire because I think that that's something that this country really needs and you know if anybody if anybody out there wants advice you know send me a message because uh you know I'm 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 down for helping minorities because I think we gotta we gotta help each other for sure Henry if people wanted to find you online where could they find you uh they could uh I, I should probably well I'll give you the website but I'll also give you my email because uh okay. the email will be the best way to to find me or to reach me. Uh, the website for our company is planandact.com. That's P-L-A-N-A-N-D-A-C-T.com. And then my email address is henry.gibson at planandact.com. Very cool. Any questions I didn't ask you or anything you wanted to share that I we didn't get to today? No, that was about it. Um, yeah, I just, uh, I hope everybody, <laughs> The, I think, you know what, I'm going to just say one more time, I'm going to repeat something because this is something that's come up in conversation so many times. Charge what you're worth. 
because there's so many people that are out there that are just, they feel bad, they're artists and they feel bad about charging what they're really worth. Charge what you're worth. I love what you said before in the last podcast about don't do a COVID discount, don't do family discounts, charge what you're worth, know what you're worth because you absolutely are. And, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play dumb here because I, I had some people ask me this, how do I know what I'm worth? Well, what I would, we you know what, it's kind of, it's kind of what, it's kind of a, I think partly a feeling. Um, I asked somebody what they thought they were worth and they said a hundred dollars if, you, and I was a hundred dollars an hour. And I was like, yes, you know, they're, they're a performer here in town. And they, mm-hmm. they said a hundred dollars an hour. And that's from, you know, not just wages, but also how much is my friendship worth? What, mm-hmm. what value am I adding to other people's lives? A hundred dollars mm-hmm. an hour. And I said, yes, that is absolutely true. Yeah. Uh, if you're looking for a more numerical <laughs> way to find what you're <laughs> worth, uh, one good, one good way to start is find out whatever the cost of goods is for, for your business and make sure adding, like, I would start at like, I don't know, I would start at like 50% profit margin. And then, you know, if that's too much and you're, you're pricing yourself out of the market, mm-hmm. cut back from there, but you are worth so, but we're, we're all just worth so much more than we put ourselves out there for so much, so much of the time. Yeah. It's just being savvy about it. I tell people it's being savvy. Like what you said, what is your time worth? Like as a comedian, I sometimes I'll give a price and I don't take into account the, the travel time to get there, mm-hmm. the, the idling time, because sometimes like if you're going there for a wedding, they're only going to pay you for the 30 minutes that you're on stage, but they ask you to get there an hour ahead of time and eat with the bride and groom and mingle and like, you got to pay, you got to pay for valet parking, which is expensive sometimes. And so yeah. you, you got to take into account all these things. And then you've got to take into account just your time. What is your time worth? What could you be doing in that time, right? That you're at this wedding performing for 30 minutes. Um, and the yeah. same thing goes with what you said about like when you're buying goods and setting prices, you've really got to think about everything that goes into that. Because I think a lot of people start these Shopify stores and they don't realize, okay, you have to pay Shopify. Mm -hmm. Then you have to, you have to buy the materials. Then Mm -hmm. you have to pay credit card fees. Then you've got to pay shipping fees. Then you've got to pay sales tax. You've got to do the math and you've just got to sit down and add it up. And then you add, you, I, I add all that stuff up and then I add customers, customer experience. What am I bringing to the table that the other company is not bringing to the table? And then figuring out, is that really worth all my time and money? Because maybe there's something else I should be doing instead. Yeah, absolutely. I'll I'll tell you, I'll tell you this one story of, uh, with my, with my agent, my agent would send me, uh, audition notices from, they would be in like Georgia or something like that Mm -hmm. for like $125 for the entire day. And uh, my agent would send me this audition and would say, Hey, submit this, this audition. And I would respond by breaking down. This is how much it would cost for me to do the taping. This is how much it would cost for me to standard mileage to get to Georgia. This is how much it would cost me to rent a room overnight because I'm not going to be driving up and then back. That's 12 hours. That's not going to be safe. This is how much money it would cost for food. I would break it all down, including this is how much money I'd be losing at Universal. And at the end of the day, this is how much money I would be losing by taking this gig. So I'm not going to audition for this. Right. And uh, I think I really annoyed my agent with that, <laughs> but also that's what that's what made me that's what made me able to sustain acting uh, mm-hmm. for such a long time. Um, mm-hmm. That I got there's there are good paying gigs out there. You just have mm-hmm. to know know what you're worth. For right. me, I was losing money. It's not worth my time. Right, and I think that's really hard. That's such a great point because as creatives, we get we get so wrapped up in gigs and stuff and we don't want to let anything go we don't want someone else to take that gig from us like we get I don't know if it's an envious thing or a nervous thing that we may not get the opportunity again or we're going to burn bridges but we lose creatives I think in general lose money a lot on gigs and stuff because we we are so for one we don't do the math like you did sometimes we don't do the math but second of all we're just so afraid to say no and I guess how did you how did you even come up with the courage to be able to tell your agent no like where did you I guess, where do you get that self-esteem or self-worth from to know that you're going to get another gig in the future? I, uh, for me, it, I think it, somebody, I, I'm going to, I don't remember, I can't give credit to who told me this, but somebody told me, another actor told me that if I take a low paying gig, I am actually not, not only hurting myself, but the next person to be offered that similar gig because mm-hmm. they're not going to be able to afford it either. And if I'm aware that it's a bad idea, it's a bad pay rate, I'm, you know, I, I, that next person might not be aware. So I, you know, that's, that's one of the things that really helped me early on was be, was knowing like, I, this isn't just for me. I'm teaching these, I'm teaching these companies 
they can't just get us for pennies on the dollar because that mm -hmm. that ends up hurting all of us. Mm -hmm. um, so making it making it really like visceral like that, you know, having a real strong reason why. Um, so there were times that it was really difficult. Uh, a, a couple times where I asked for a pay raise and I was like, I really love this company, but I can't do it for that little. But that next person is going to also need this money. So I, I asked for it and sometimes I got it and sometimes I didn't. But uh, another gig always pops up. And that, that's, that's kind of one of the things that you learn when you're, when you're acting. There's always another audition. There's always something else you can be doing. So even if the one doesn't work out, something else is going to come along. Mm -hmm. Yep, I love that 100% because I, I keep trying to talk to tell people like I when I coach creatives, but people get so scared to say no. And it's scary. I know it's scary, especially when you really need the money. It's really scary. But you have like, I love how you you set you go through it, you've got to take into account all the money you're spending, especially like on food and gas and just travel time and wear and tear on your car and all that stuff. Yeah. I mean, if the, I mean, if for a lot of people, I, I think it is like a thing of they, they need some income, but if you break it down and go, oh my God, I'm, I'm losing money doing this. Mm -hmm. My purpose is income. Then I can't do this gig that that's making me lose money. Mm -hmm. There's sometimes that it might be worth it if you get to work with a really famous director or something like that. But that's only if you can afford it. If you can't mm -hmm. afford it, then you, you're basically shooting yourself in the foot. And mm -hmm. a lot of us creatives, we do that. And then we wonder later on why why actors are underpaid and it's because because yep. we all do this yep yep love it anything else any other last minute uh last pieces of advice or stories to share no i think i, I think you've asked that like three times now <laughs> I know. well you keep giving me so much good stuff i'm like keep giving it to me because i love how you're reiterating points i'm making so now my listeners aren't like shereen's just making this stuff up like this is like legit stuff to think about as a creative mm -hmm. um it's not just a it's not take every gig that's thrown at you. You've got to know your worth and you've got to be able to negotiate. And I think we also struggle with negotiations. Um, yeah. And I've told my listeners this, like I, I, when men, when men call me to book me on stuff, sometimes they're really rough and sometimes rude. So I'll actually ask them to email my quote unquote agent, which is just me, but it's a different email address. And then I respond to them like I'm a man <laughs> and, and mm -hmm. all of a sudden, my gig fee goes up because now they think they're communicating with a man and it's easier to negotiate. Yeah. That's, that's, that's a huge thing. Like, like, you know, I'm not, I'm not a woman, but that is absolutely <laughs> a thing out there. Um, so the, one of the, one of the things that we, we, you know, with plan and act, we actually focus on this, this mindset idea first, like I said, at the beginning, if you, if you don't work on your mindset first, when you get the strategy, it goes right out the window. Mm -hmm. it, you can know all there is to know about negotiating but if you don't believe in yourself, which we, we work on, you know, know your worth, know, know how much you're, you're valued. If you don't believe that when you're going into a negotiation, that negotiation skill is going to go right yep. out the window. Yep. Know your worth. And then know what, what's the going rate for what you are worth. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, there's going to be the open micer who's going to charge a hundred dollars for, to do, to do 30 minutes. But if you've been in the game for five to 10 years, you don't need to co you don't need to charge what that kid is charging because you bring way more to the table. Yeah, absolutely. So. From the from the business owner's point of view, I mean, you know, you're less of a risk, so they should be mm -hmm. willing to pay more if they're willing to take on a risk to save costs. Okay, that yep. kid's probably not going to do a great job. Yep, and then and they'll call you for the next show, right? And then you can double your price. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> so. Well, this has been great, Henry. This was amazing. Thank you so much for sharing your wisdom and your thoughts. And I'm sure the listeners got so much out of this. So thank you. Cool. I hope so. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening. Stay connected about upcoming resources, including opportunities, festivals, competitions, and grants to help you grow your creative passion by subscribing to my bi-monthly newsletter by visiting funnybrowngirl.com forward slash subscribe. Don't miss out on a life-changing opportunity and subscribe today at funnybrowngirl.com forward slash subscribe. And hey, if you decide to go on Instagram today, follow me. I'm Funny Brown Girl. I'm Shereen Kassam, and you've been listening to Creative Breakthrough. Now, go flex your creative muscle and keep winning.